Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Porik here from the Irish Wildlife Trust. Uh, you're very welcome to uh, the latest in our webinar series. Uh, my, how the how the year is going? It's uh, it's May already, and uh, so uh, the months seem to be ticking by. If you have missed any of our webinars uh, this year so far, make sure you go back to our YouTube channel where you can find. Um, all of our past uh, webinars from this year and the last couple of years where I think we've we've covered a, a fantastic range of topics uh, on everything from rewilding and forestry and farming and climate and biodiversity, uh, you name it. Uh, we even had um, an extra webinar a couple of weeks ago on the announcement of a new marine protected area hope spot off the southwest of Ireland. So do uh, do catch up with that. Uh, if this is your first time uh, joining us uh, for our webinar, my name is Porrick Fogarty. I'm the campaign officer with the Irish Wildlife Trust. And the Irish Wildlife Trust is a non-governmental charitable organization. Um, and our job really is to raise awareness of biodiversity and uh, wildlife and nature. And, uh, and a lot of our work is based around trying to campaign for um, well, to resolve our, our biodiversity crisis that we find ourselves uh, in. So if you like our work, if you want to support our work, please do go on to our website. It's uh, irishwildlifetrust.ie and you will get not only the knowledge that you're supporting our wonderful organization, but you get a copy of our quarterly magazine, which will go straight uh, to your home. Now, um, before I move on to our guest uh, speaker, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. As usual, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so uh, if you know anyone who missed it, uh, you can, you can uh, tell them it'll be on our YouTube channel later in the week. Um, if you have uh, questions uh, for Connor as you go along, please put them into the Q&A button. You'll see the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen there. And, uh, and we'll come to uh, questions at the end. We plan to go on for about an hour, I, I would say, not, not any longer than that. So without further ado, um, I'm very uh, ex uh, excited uh, to uh, to welcome uh, Connor Ryan to to our webinar series. This issue, I have to say, has fascinated me since since I learned about uh, the facts that uh, Ireland had a whaling industry. I had no idea until I started researching my own book a couple of years ago. Um, I thought whaling was something that was done uh, by the Americans and the Japanese and so on. Um, and it really is a, a fascinating story. And what Connor has done, he has recently published an article in the Irish Naturalist Journal, a very venerable uh, publication, um, looking at the history of whaling and, uh, and the data around the types of whales that were being caught and so on. And Connor will, will give us obviously more detail um, on that. But just for background, uh, Connor is, a, is a, a zoologist. He's from Cove in County Cork originally, but he's based in the Hebrides in Scotland. And Connor conducts research on the migration and distribution of whales. Um, and he also works as a guide uh, for uh, Linbald expeditions in National Geographic. And if I may say, Connor, you have a great Twitter feed. Um, your 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 tweets can pop up. It seems at any point in the globe. Sometimes in Antarctica, and some some amazing uh, stories and things from uh, from your from your travels. So thank you very much, uh, Connor, for joining us uh, this evening. And uh, I will pass over to you if you want to share your screen in your own time, please. Here we go. Yeah. Thanks, Barry, for the introduction. Um, and just before I share my screen, um, you mentioned um, the paper there in the Irish Naturalist Journal. Um, and kind of alluded to the difficulty in finding out information about um, the Irish whaling industry. And um, when I was a kid, this was the this was the basically the only source of information is Irish whales and whaling. Uh, James Fairley, um, who recently passed away, unfortunately. Um, but uh, this was essentially the only the only literature source about whaling in Ireland, and it's out of print, so it's a very hard book to get. Um, and I, I think, yeah, it kind of it's lost from our our collective psyche, the fact that we had a, a very active whaling industry uh, at one point. So um, I will just share my screen there, two seconds. If you, can you see that okay, Parvik? Uh, I certainly can, yeah, all good. Yeah, brilliant. yeah excellent. Okay, so um, as the title says, I'm going to speak about uh, whales and whaling in Ireland. And it's essentially 100 years ago, 
um, as of last year was the last time we had a shore-based uh, whaling or the last time whales were landed uh, ashore in Ireland, as, as you see here. Um, whaling had a very short, or shore-based whaling had a very short period in Ireland. It was just uh, eight or nine years uh, in duration, and it was all in the early 1900s uh, until 1922. And that whaling didn't stop then. Um, visiting whalers came to Irish waters to, to kill humpback, or sorry, to kill um, bottlenose and minke whales up until 1976, uh, or just before 1976, uh, when the Wildlife Act then prohibited it. And what was very, what's very special about the whaling I'm talking about here is that the whales were, were landed um, uh, ashore in Ireland um, and could be investigated and could be. Uh, counted and documented, and um, uh, I was very interested in the ecology and um, that we could learn about uh, these whales from from back then. So, by looking at the whaling records, we're getting getting a lens into um, the, the seas of 100 years ago, and seeing species that we no longer see in our waters, um, and learning about species that we do still have in our waters, and um, things like what they eat, and um, the sex ratio. Uh, how many of them are pregnant at any one time, body lengths and that kind of thing. Um, all the while it's, it, it's quite tragic. Um, you know, it's very, very sad to look through these whaling records and see uh, what we've lost. And, and that's the key message for me really is, is what we've lost. Um, when you think of whaling in, in this region, and um, you probably think uh, it's something that's consigned to the past, um, but unfortunately whaling science still happens in Ireland and the UK. Um, where you have research organizations um, becoming involved in science that involves the intentional killing of whales and dolphins. So while whaling and, and killing of dolphins is illegal in Ireland, unfortunately, there are researchers in Ireland that are still conducting research um, uh, involving the intentional killing of whales. So the issue is no longer over. Um, and if you're interested in the, the kind of ethical side of that, it's active research I'm doing at the moment, and I'd be happy to, to share papers with you. But for now, I'll just, I'm going to focus in this talk on, on the, the historical whaling, um, which I find quite, quite fascinating. I can move my first slide. There we go. Um, here's an old picture. I'm going to start from way back. Um, I'm going to begin at the, the, the beginning of commercial whaling. So when whaling um, was conducted for profit and as a business venture, um, and it all started with the Basques, and um, they basically pioneered whaling, and it was the style, the style of whaling that you see depicted in this picture, um, hand-thrown harpoons from small boats, very, very dangerous, uh, and uh, they basically gave us the word harpoon. It's the only Basque word that I'm aware of in the, in, in the English language. Uh, harpoon was a Basque, uh, a Basque invention and a Basque word. And they very quickly eradicated their um, their right whales, the, the northern right whale, um, and because they are a coastal species, and the Basques particularly favoured capturing the calves. Um, no sooner had they eradicated them locally that they they went further afield. Um, so by the 1300s um, to the 1500s, they were in the Celtic Sea, um, probably catching right whales um, close to land in Ireland. Um, and then um, they went further afield. They went to Newfoundland and Labrador. And um, from uh, 1530, uh, sorry, for, for an 80 year period, from the 1530s onwards, they captured between 25,000 and 40,000 um, right whales, which is absolutely staggering. And um, so the Basques had a huge impact on, on whales and definitely altered the seas as we know them today. Um, so it's interesting because it, it, it's important that we, we don't fall into the trap of thinking that people with primitive tools or, or methodologies were incapable of impacting um, large mammals. They absolutely were. Um, we've lost a an, an species entirely from the North Atlantic, the, the grey whale, and there's increasing evidence that that may have been due to human exploitation. And certainly the extinction of the right whale on this side of the Atlantic is, it was due to exploitation uh, over exploitation and um, Ireland had a part to play in that unfortunately. And so the first shore-based whaling in Ireland was in the 1770s and it was carried out by a uh, Donegal man named Thomas Nesbitt. Um, he is um, he was the, one of the inventors of, of the harpoon gun. Um, some argue that he was the, the, fir the first inventor of the harpoon gun. It wasn't the exploding harpoon, it's what known as the cold harpoon, but basically 
Um, there are two problems, as it were, when you're trying to capture a whale. Uh, first is, is killing it, dispatching it, and second is actually retrieving it. Um, the harpoon is tethered, so you're essentially tethering yourself to a very angry whale. And um, uh, so you need a, it's something that fires a, a heavy arrow-like thing, which is the harpoon. And then you need to make sure you're attached to it. So when the whale swims away, that you don't lose it. And Thomas Nesbitt invented that. And he was um, basing his business in the um, in Donegal Bay in a, a little pier called Port in Donegal Bay in a village called Inver. And he's still buried there. And the remains of that whaling station are still visible. So this is the area I'm talking about. You can see in the back of Donegal Bay there, um, uh, the village of Inver. And uh, this is where Ireland's first whaling happened from. There's very little information known about the total um, landings. Um, excellent work done by Sean O'Callaghan, um, published in the Proceedings of the Royal Irish Academy. He, he found that there's at least nine right whales were landed here in the 1770s. Uh, and that's an absolute minimum. There's probably a lot more than that. Here is kind of modern day Inver, if you like. Uh, this is the, the little uh, village that's there. And this photograph was taken by McNary in 2008 when he did a um, archaeological survey of the old whaling station um, uh, that was built by Nesbitt. And these are the remains of the building. So if you're interested in, in kind of um, industrial archaeology and, and the whaling history of Ireland, um, it's definitely worth uh, visiting this site. And it's kind of a shame, really, for many reasons, it's a shame that there's not more interpretation on it. Um, although I only let, I visited the site maybe 12 years ago, so that may have changed. This is the first known um, photograph of a right whale in Ireland. And unfortunately, the last known photograph of a whale of a right whale in Ireland was taken um, just 12 years later. So we only have photographs of this species in Irish waters for 12 years. And they were, I think this photograph was from 1908, um, as far as I know. The photographer is unknown, but its photograph is, is published in James Fairley's book and in Sean O'Callan's paper as well. And it's a right whale being hauled up. Um, a slipway at uh, Rushing Island, which is one of the whaling stations um, uh, that opened in 1908. So Ireland had three shore-based whaling stations. The first one was this one in Inver, and that closed in the uh, late 1700s. And then you had a 100-year gap, or maybe more, 200-year um, gap, um, uh, to 1908, which is when uh, this um, whaling station opened in um, in County Mayo on the Inishkey Islands. And then a, a third one opened nearby, uh, near Black Sod. And it, it, those two wedding stations, the latter ones that I'll be um, mostly speaking about um, for this presentation. And so when the station at the Inishkey Islands opened, um, this uh, British naturalist and zoologist was sent over to investigate and to basically glean as much information as he could about the whales that were being landed. Um, People had very little information about how whales worked, basically, and what they ate and how big they could get and that type of thing. And they had essentially no information about their migration habits. Um, so Dennis Lilly was sent over on behalf of the British government to um, take notes, and uh, he took incredible detailed notes. He was an interesting character. He, um, he worked in Antarctica. In fact, he had to leave his um, post um, in Ireland early in order to go down to Antarctica and to work with Scott. Um, but he was basically the discoverer of the whale earwax. And you might say, so what? That just sounds pointless. Or, um, but it was uh, it was him who discovered this uh, waxy plug in in the in the um, in the ears of whales and and noted that it had lamina on it. And later on, it was proved, and he suspected it, that um, each each uh, layer was um, approximately a year of growth. So this is the way that we still age baleen whales today. And it was discovered in County Mayo um, by this English scientist, Dennis Lilly. Um, Lilly took very um, important notes, uh, which helped me um, in when I was writing my paper recently. And um, in particular, he mentioned that uh, in the Inishkees, um, the whalers began uh, in 1908, and they did. They only had to go 10 miles from the from the island, um, and then by the following year, they were going out to 60 miles. 
and he, did, he mentioned that they were very secretive about their whaling ground. And this is a big problem when it comes to reconstructing um, uh, elements of the whaling industry in the past in Ireland. Um, careful notes weren't really taken about the, um, the details at sea, where the vessels were working and how many shots they were taking and how many whales they were seeing. All of the evidence that we have were from the likes of Lily um, on land, on, ashore, um, and he mentioned that yeah, they were quite secretive about where they were capturing the whales. This is quite unlike in Scotland. Um, I published a paper with colleagues recently in another journal last year about the Scottish uh, shore-based whaling. And in Scotland, the law um, was such that whalers had to document the exact location of every whale capture. Um, this wasn't the case in Ireland. So unfortunately, we all have a very vague idea about where the whales were distributed at sea at that time. Um, so what I've done here in this map is uh, that, that red circle is uh, everything is what Lily claims the, where the whalers were hunting uh, for the first year. And then um, this is the whaling ground um, for, for most or all of the, uh, the, the shore based whaling period from 1909 to 1922. Um, so what I've done here is taken the kind of average radius um, based on the Scottish whaling industry and um, superimposed it over Ireland to say that the, the whaling ground was probably the same kind of size as the whaling grounds in Scotland because they were using the same technology. They were actually using the same personnel and sometimes swapping ships um, and uh, sharing expertise that way and, and technology. So um, I'm assuming here that the whaling grounds in Ireland were the same kind of size as the ones in, in Scotland. And you might say, well, why, why does that matter? Why bother having to find out that information or infer it? Um, well, if we want to know about the kind of whale densities that were around at the time and the general distribution of the species that were caught, we need to have an idea of what the extent of the whaling ground was. That pink box there is what the International Whaling Commission considered the Irish whaling um, ground was, but I think it's a bit smaller than that. And we'll go with the kind of blue disc there, um, which kind of radiates out from um, the Inish Key and Black Sod. They weren't allowed to catch um, whales east of Kilala Bay, as far as I know, um, and maybe they got down as far as uh, Loop Head, but um, out to the shelf edge west of Mayo. So a key question when dealing with historical um, information is, is the reliability of, of that information. And I must say, I'm not a historian, I'm a zoologist, so this, uh, this whaling, um, historical whaling project was my first kind of time delving into archives and um, I was very interested in saying, well, how can we, how can we try and establish if the data are reliable or not? Um, and one thing that was recorded quite faithfully was, um, or um, quite meticulously, I should say, was the body lengths of all the whales. And we have some information about um, uh, how, that, how those lengths were taken. Um, and um, I'm pretty confident that those uh, lengths are comparable between the species. And in, in other words, that were, each whale was measured in, in roughly the same way. Um, if you take, um, if you plot a length distribution, so on the y-axis here is is basically the frequency or the count of whales um, that are that are at a given length on the on the x-axis. Um, in biology, you get lovely bell curves if um, if uh, you get a normal distribution uh, in nature for most things. You do so with humans as well. Uh, if we were to measure everybody in a room, you'd get a lovely bell curve. Um, but then if you asked people in a room to tell you their height, you would get a bell curve with a little pokey bit sticking out of it, maybe, because people sometimes overestimate their height, particularly people round up to six foot. Um, so the idea here is that you're looking for systematic errors in the data. Um, and actually, the lengths um, of the whales were um, mostly conforming to bell curve, which is Good. That gives me faith in the data. And the other thing I was interested in was the species assignment. So we didn't really know how, um, or I didn't know how the people recording these whales, how they actually determined what species they were looking at. Uh, it's much easier to see what species of whale you have when it's dead in front of you. Um, so you could, you'd say, well, surely they were good at it. But then again, at the time, they had a very poor understanding um, about what species were, were out there and the taxonomy was being re revised as well. Anyways, the um, length, the average length where those lines come down in the center of these curves um, is, is feasible. In other words, it's what you'd expect these days for, for these, the, these species of whales. So all that to say, and um, the length data were, were trustworthy and um, that's a good sign. Um, hopefully then that the sex assignment was, was uh, accurate as well. Um, 
one thing that the uh, biologists that visited the whaling stations did was they um, took a sample of um, stomachs from whales and they only did this for two months of the year, I think July and August. So um, the, the diet information that we have from these years, it's pretty coarse, um, but we essentially know nothing else about the diet of whales from back then. And in fact, we know very little about the diet of whales in, in Ireland these days even. So um, this information, although it's coarse, is very, very, uh, is very useful. Um, uh, sorry, I'm talking about diet, I should talk about landings, uh, total landings. So um, here you have the, um, the landings by species and the take home message from this slide is early on in the, the whaling period in 1908, you saw um, a, a large species diversity. So um, the first couple of years, they were typically catching um, in um, six species of whales were being landed. And by the end of the whaling period, you see um, only uh, three species, three or four species are being landed. So uh, very quickly, um, right whales, humpback whales, and even sea whales um, started to dwindle in numbers um, from the landings. And they were very valuable whales. If they were encountering them, they surely would have been catching them. They're also easier to catch um, compared to the likes of, of fin whales, for example, which dominated the catch. So I don't think they were overlooking them. I think they just could not find them. And certainly there are notes written by biologists during that time that, that indicate that. Um, this is a um, probably an unnecessarily complex slide, but I just wanted to use the um, the figures from the paper from the Irish Naturalist Journal paper and um, the the sex distribution or the the the, um, the ratio of males to females is is very interesting because I can tell you about um, how the animals are migrating through Irish waters or how they were. Um, you know, if they're doing, if they're migrating according to, to sex or pregnancy status and that kind of thing, um, it, it's interesting to look at that because um, you could assume that if that was the case back um, in the whaling time, that's probably the case today. Um, so if you look at the far right there, sperm whales, that's exactly essentially what we see today. Um, uh, male sperm whales live in high latitudes um, from Ireland north, and it's very, very rare that you get females. They, they spend their time, uh, their entire lives in, in the tropics um, with, with their young and the males go down to visit them and then return to high latitudes. So that's very well reflected in the, in the whaling data. And um, only the bars in color were the ones were the species with statistically significant um, differences between the sexes. Um, so the assumption here is that whalers went out and just randomly caught whatever um, they, they found and that this um, sex um, um, ratio should be reflect what was actually swimming around in the sea at the time. So very interestingly, we had a situation where um, blue whales, there were far more female blue whales than there were males, and um, there was also the opposite was the case for say whales, so very few females in say whales and, and lots of males. So um, um, I get into a bit more discussion on that in the paper, the significance of that, but obviously um, for something that's highly threatened today, like a blue whale, and um, the fact that Ireland was once important for females is something that we really need to take note of, and perhaps it was, um, uh, you know, a place where they came um, particularly um, to have their young, who knows? Um, certainly, there were some um, there were some young uh, blue whales there. If I go back to this slide, um, you can see they caught blue whales that were um, just 13 and 14 meters in length. So they're young blue whales, and and several of the blue whales were pregnant as well. And you can see they're also taking calves from the northern right whales, um, and some right whales were taken that were. Uh, just eight meters long, so they would have been born very close to um, to or even in Irish waters. Um, I mentioned the diet earlier on. This is actually the correct slide for the diet. So um, I mentioned the diet dietary information is is quite coarse. Uh, we don't know a huge amount about how the biologists were um, analyzing the stomachs uh, of each whale. And we don't know how they're identifying the species either. And it's quite a tricky task and um, to be confronted with you know, a couple of tons of, um, of putrefying stomachs. So we don't know how, how they managed uh, um, to identify the, the species. Nonetheless, um, it's, it's still interesting to know anything about uh, what was found in the stomachs. That's not information that can be accessed today. Um, so blue whales were feeding exclusively on krill and the fin whales had a very small proportion of fish and herring. Um, and other small crustaceans um, and, and otherwise mostly krill. And that kind of lines up um, 
with uh, my PhD work um, over 10 years ago now in the Celtic Sea, where we found um, some whales were feeding on uh, on herring, um, but more than half of the diet was was dominated by krill. And again, I must say that the, the dietary information that I'm showing here is just from July and August. So if these whales switch to a different prey item at a different time of year, uh, that won't be reflected in these data. Um, what's really puzzling for me is krill in the diet of a sperm whale. Um, I uh, don't know how to account for that, um, but it could be a secondary ingestion thing where um, the squid that they were eating were possibly feeding on krill and then uh, the whale's eating both uh, when it's eating the, eating the squid. Um, so that may be why you're finding krill in the, in the diet of the sperm whales. But the reality is we can't go back and find out how they, how they got these data. Um, this slide um, tells us a bit about the seasonality. Um, and so this this requires a little bit of explaining. Um, I was really interested in finding out a little bit about the migration of these whales. Um, Irish waters are both a feeding ground for some species and a migration corridor for others. And increasingly, we're realizing actually that the likes of blue and fin whales um, seem to just migrate and eat as they go. So this idea that they have discrete parts of their lives where they're completely starving and then gorging themselves, that might not be fully true. It seems that they have kind of snacking stations along their migration route. Anyways, I was interested in the timing of the migrations and um, one way to get at this information from the landing data was to look at the date in which each whale was landed. And um, what I've done here is a, an accumulation curve. So um, the first, the earliest, species that they were encountering each year um, was, was the right whale. So um, basically each curve is um, the proportion of whales landed by each date. So um, the steeper the curve, the earlier um, they were catching them basically, or the further left the curve is, the earlier they were catching the whales. So if you, for argument's sake, ask um, in a given year, how, uh, at what point in the year or what month uh, had they caught 50% of the total of, of uh, right whales? Um, well, that point was in, in late May for right whales. 50% um, of the catch was accumulated for say whales by um, early June. And it wasn't until July that they had accumulated 50% of their um, sperm whale catches each year and later still for, for humpbacks, although very few humpbacks were caught during this whole period anyway. So the data there are quite coarse. 50% um, of the humpback are the fin whales were um, caught by early August, uh, late July. And it wasn't until mid August that they had accumulated 50% of their blue whales each year. So you can basically um, see that the, the whales that the whalers were encounter, encountering, it was changing as the season wore on. It started with the copepod feeders. So those guys on the left, the say whales and the right whales are specifically specialized in copepods. These days we only get one copepod kind of mega planktivore the, in, the, um, in the west coast of Ireland, which is the, the basking shark. Um, but it would be nice to see the return of the say whales, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, the sperm whale is in the middle and the catches or the landings of sperm whales simply reflects that the whalers were looking for better wet weather windows to go offshore because they had to go further out to catch sperm whales because they were um, feeding in, in deeper waters. Um, the fin whales, um, they were catching throughout the year, but uh, they were you know, in, in bigger numbers a little bit later in the season. And um, same with blue whales. Blue whales were not caught until um, late June at all. And they wouldn't be overlooking the blue whales if they were there. So this points to a genuine trend of um, blue whale occurrence um, kind of coming online in July and peaking in August or September. Um, so the, the last whales that were landed, like I said, uh, at the beginning was in 19, 1922. And um, it's it's kind of shocking to me. These these images are haunting to think that we had uh, right whales swimming around our our waters in Ireland and also here where I live in the Hebrides. Um, and there was I think it was close to was it 130 or so right whales were killed um, in Ireland and and the Hebrides uh, around the same time. And um, it seems to have gone functionally extinct and certainly commercially extinct um, by by the um, early 1920s. Um, this type of whaling happened in Ireland up until the early 70s, and that's what I'm focusing my research on now. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going 
back to the archives and um, trying to access information about what uh, what vessels were operating in Irish waters from Norway um, in the seven, in the sixties and seventies, uh, capturing minke whales, putting them on ice and bringing them all the way back to Norway. And they were doing the same with bottlenose whales and basking sharks. Um, so this is information that's very hard to very hard to access, and it's often in Norwegian. So we're relying on um, Norwegian translators as well. Yeah, but it's very important that we know this information because we're kind of in the dark a little bit about um, what our conservation goals must be. Um, I, I get very pedantic when I see um, conservation policy coming out about conserving something when it comes to whales anyway, because um, we shouldn't be just conserving what's left. We need to be thinking about restoring um, what was lost. If we're just conserving what's left, um, we're basically accepting a very denuded um, habitat and a very probably poorly functioning ecosystem as well. And we need to be thinking about restoring um, uh, whatever species haven't gone extinct in this area, allowing them to recover. And you know the fact that there were whales caught in our waters until the 70s, it's very important that we get within our handle on that to, to figure out well, what's, what's normal, what baseline are we, are we aiming for. Um, it's a very rare situation um, to be able to put faces to the people who are responsible for the extinction of a species. Um, the northern right whale is not extinct um, in, uh, yet, um, but it's, it's heading that way, unfortunately. There's only a few hundred, uh, maybe 300 left in the other side of the, Atlant of the Atlantic, but it's um, essentially it's extinct in the eastern North Atlantic. And there's some evidence that the right whales were a totally different population. The ones over here, um, they had different markings. The whalers mentioned they had different uh, color patterns uh, in the east uh, compared to the west. And the length, length distributions that I've looked at uh, seem to be different as well. So the eastern North Atlantic right whale, which is no longer with us, uh, it was these two guys basically who, um, who profited from its elimination uh, from our waters. Um, Carl Herlofsson was the owner of the Hebridean uh, whaling station and Lawrence Brune was the owner of the last operating shore-based whaling station in, in Ireland. Um, they had moved their whaling stations from Iceland, which is where uh, they first found right whales, um, and then they moved them to Ireland and, and Scotland. And once they had finished up there, they literally packed up the whaling stations and moved them to Spain and kept uh, whaling down there. Uh, they were fully aware, it seems, uh, from the from the writing and the diary entries and things like that that I've read. It seems that they were fully aware of the impacts that they were having on right whales, and they, towards the end, they became quite secretive about where they were finding right whales. Um, and the data show that it did, they didn't hold back. Um, they actually thought the right whales were already extinct um, because they were extinct in Norwegian waters. Um, but when they rediscovered them in Ireland and Scotland, um, they didn't make any effort to to conserve what was left. Uh, quite the opposite. Um, so when we're thinking about the, the whaling period in Ireland, although it was 100 years ago, um, the shore-based whaling, um, we have to bear in mind that even though it stopped, shore-based whaling stopped in Ireland, it did continue to occur elsewhere. So this is an incredible picture, a colour photograph um, from Alex Aguilar's recent paper on blue whale uh, whaling in Spain. And it shows um, the whaling station uh, that was taken from Ireland and brought down to Spain. Um, this is it in colour, and it was operating up until uh, the 80s. And in one year, I think it was 1978 or 79, they landed nine blue whales. Um, so even though whaling stopped uh, locally in Irish waters and in Scottish waters, we can't really expect um, the whales to bounce back in numbers. Um, soon because they were being impacted elsewhere and even today they're being uh, hunted in, in Iceland and um, you have fin whales being landed there still and uh, hunting happens in all of the waters to our north. Um, it happens in uh, Greenland, Iceland, Faroes and Norway in various different guises um, and affecting various different species. Um, so the point being it will take a while before we see um, um, before we're likely to see uh, whales recovering. Um, when I'm working, I work for each winter down in Antarctica in the Southern Ocean, and um, we're seeing dramatic recovery of whales in some places there. Um, but that's, you know, that's a long time after whaling ceased completely. Um, and there are no, are very, sorry, there were few other human impacts uh, in those areas that I visit up until recently when the krill fishing 
um, really, really took off. Um, so the point being that um, it, although we stopped killing whales um, in Ireland from, from the shore, they were still being impacted all around us. And uh, we're not just going to see a quick recovery on uh, probably for another few decades. Um, and that's really why it's important that we limit the other impacts so that whales actually do have a chance to recover. Uh, I'll talk about those other impacts soon. It's not totally depressing. So blue whales were heard by Simon Barrow and Joanne O'Brien and colleagues um, by putting out um, bottom mounted hydrophones. So they put hydrophones on the on the on moorings on the seabed and left them for a few months. And they did actually hear um, blue whale calls to the west of the Porcupine Bank. Um, they didn't hear any calls in the uh, in the old whaling ground. Um, and um, there are still occasionally blue whales seen. Um, this is the blue whale I photographed. Uh, it was 220 miles south of Cape Clear, so not quite in Irish waters, but it was heading towards Irish waters. Um, it was um, technically closer to France than it was to Ireland, um, but it's the only blue whale I've seen. Um, and the, I've done many years um, of research on whales in the Celtic Sea and offshore to the west of Ireland um, in all seasons. and. Um, only once seen a blue whale, but they're around and given the chance that uh, it could hopefully recover. Um, closer to where I live in Scotland, um, uh, Nink, uh, Vinka, sorry, Ninka Vangil and colleagues um, have done similar studies um, putting hydrophones on the Malin Shelf and west of the Hebrides, and they're finding um, calls from these species that you see on screen here. So yellow would be the um, the stronger detections are the higher number of hours of, of whale calls. Blue is no, no whale calls. So you can see fin whales, it's quite a number of fin whale um, calls being documented there. Um, seasonally, uh, humpbacks are being heard. Um, minke whales also, and say whales are in very, very low numbers and um, are really considered quite, uh, quite scarce. Um, this particular study didn't document any blue whales, um, despite the Hebrides being um, the most uh, important place for blue whale landings um, in, in, in Europe, basically. Um, so I'm kind of thinking here about the, um, the shifting baseline syndrome and, and you know, what's normal. Um, we have one species that's certainly extinct from Irish waters, which is the grey whale. Um, it's found in archaeological digs all along the, the, the western seaboard of Europe. Um, from the 1700s, um, but no longer with us. And it seems that the right whale is, is extinct in, in our waters on the eastern side of the North Atlantic and unfortunately potentially heading that way um, over in the west. Um, sail whales could only be considered vagrant here, I think. There's very few records. They're very noteworthy um, when they are seen, um, but they were extremely common and they were the second most commonly landed species in uh, Ireland and Scotland during the, the whaling period. Uh, blue whales are very scarce these days, but not, not gone. Um, and these species on the right are, are doing okay. Uh, in fact, um, fin whales and humpback whales are, are recovering um, something like three to 4% per decade. Um, so they're making a, a slow recovery, um, but now other threats uh, replace the, the kind of lagged threat of whaling. Um, Species that are intentionally killed, I feel like even though um, from a conservation point of view, some people argue that this isn't the biggest issue, you know, ship strikes and unintentional killing um, is the bigger issue. Um, but this is the issue that we can do something about most readily, um, you know, stop intentionally killing them. Um, and these are species that are intentionally killed at the moment in waters around Ireland. So um, uh, plenty of evidence that all of these species um, swim between um, Ireland, Iceland, the Faroes, Norway. Um, so they don't belong to those countries that are capturing them. Um, but it's um, it's a massive um, animal welfare issue. They're killed in horrendous circumstances and um, long, long times to death. And um, yeah, just really shocking stuff. It's hard to believe that it's happening in our neighbouring countries. And I think perhaps we're being too polite by uh, not... Um, not asking them to stop enough. Um, although the Irish government has officially um, asked the Icelandic government to stop uh, on occasion and um, made formal diplomatic objections to Icelandic whaling, which, which was good. Um, 
These are the most significant threats to whales today. Um, this is a ship strike on the left. Uh, it's a big problem. And this minke whale up in Sligo was um, entangled in, in creels or, or pots, um, and which is a huge problem here in Scotland. Uh, half of our minke whales, where I live in the Hebrides, uh, half of the dead minke whales uh, die in entanglement situations. Um, I, I know it's not completely clear about the entanglement risk in Ireland, but I imagine it's quite high. Um, there are similar, similar fisheries happening in Ireland and Scotland. Um, and then direct competition for prey. So um, I know the pair trawling of sprat and the fact that sprat don't have a quota um, has been in the spotlight quite a lot. And that's essentially uh, going to be preventing whales from making a recovery and from stopping and spending time in Irish waters. Um, if they have no food here, um, they have no reason to, to stay. Um, so that's, uh, that's the end uh, of my slides. I'm going to show you some quick video footage. Um, but just first, I just want to thank the, the people on the screen for uh, their encouragement and conversations and help uh, with accessing data and interpreting data. Um, I just want to show you some footage from um, Robert Paul, and I hope you can hear uh, see it. I hope you can hear it. Can you see that okay, Boric? Can you give me a thumbs yeah, up? Yeah, we're seeing that. Thanks. Cool. Um, I may not play the whole thing, but just uh, this footage was um, uh, taken by a guy called Robert Paul in 1908, and he went to Mayo and went out on, on these whaling ships and took incredible footage, uh, giving us a very important insight really into how um, how whales were captured and the kind of weather conditions that they were operating in. Uh, this is a fair weather day in the summer by the looks of it, um, and you can see the swiveling harpoon gun there on the bow. Um, it's astonishing that whales are still killed in this exact same way in Iceland um, and Norway. Um, the methods have not changed in 100 years, um, and um, it's equally as cruel today as it was back then. Um, uh, this that either looks like it's it could be a blue whale or a fin whale. I think it might be a blue whale. The dorsal fin was very was very small. Um, this guy, Robert Paul, who made the footage, he was an inventor, uh, cinematographer, and very interested in uh, inventing and copying ways of projecting um, films on screen. And he made this just before he retired, I believe. And it's in the Irish Film Archive. Um, it has very twee music with it, so I'm going to spare you that. <laughs> um, and I know Ken O'Sullivan, I think, in one of his documentaries, um, included some footage from, from this. Um, stock footage, but you can see there the whale is tethered to the ship and they're basically going to tire it out and haul it in. Um, it must be said the people who were operating in this uh, at, at this time, they were heroes. They were, you know, pulling Ireland out of um, economic ruin in certain places anyway. In Mayo, they were, you know, they were a godsend and they were providing um, work for locals and uh, they were making money and um, the the whale oil was being used to make margarine, um, and but also used as a fuel, but mostly as a foodstuff. And around the times of you know the, between the world wars, uh, that was very important. Um, so yeah, although we will judge them harshly nowadays given the impact, um, they were heroes of their time, and they were very proud of what they were doing. And in many ways, they were very highly skilled at it. So. It's, um, I always feel very conflicted when I'm watching this. It's obviously horrendous footage. Um, I'll fast forward a little bit. You can see a whale in tow here along the side of the ship. They cut the side of the flukes off um, to, st to stop the whale drifting too far because um, they often kill a few whales, float them, and then go back and gather them up afterwards and bring them back to the, back to the base, the shore base. Um, this is... Um, that was Inishki, the Inishki Islands, Russian Bay. Um, and here you see a blue whale being hauled up the slipway in the Inishki Islands in, in County Mayo. Um, you can tell it's a blue whale because its belly is dark, uh, or not dark, it's, it's all uniformly coloured. The fin whales have a white belly, whereas the blue whales have a, a dark belly. Uh, and you can see the freckles, this kind of mottling pattern and the white pectoral fins white underneath. This is a, a female blue whale. And between the two men there, the, the mammary uh, slits are visible. You can see it's a female. Um, so the blubber was up there mostly after, and actually most of the rest of the carcass went to waste. 
Um, the blubber was tried out. It was kind of boiled, if you like, or steamed um, in order to get the uh, to get the oil out of the blubber. And then um, that went for fuel originally, and then eventually um, uh, products like margarine. I'll fast forward a little bit. It's pretty gruesome stuff. Um, there's the baleen section is quite interesting. Here's two guys um, cleaning baleen. These baleen plates are from right whales, northern right whales. Look at the length of them. They're over two meters long, some of these baleen plates. Um, so the baleen from the right whales was very, very valuable. It was the only material around at the time that was um, thermoplastic. So you could heat up baleen and cool it down again and it would keep its shape. So it was used for corsets, umbrellas, brushes, and it was, you know, it was quite the technology at the time. We didn't have um, plastics as we know them back then. Here they're repairing um, they're repairing a harpoon head um, on, on an anvil. Um, most of the skilled personnel were Norwegian. Um, you can see he's fitting the explosive harpoon head there to a harpoon. Um, it was mostly Norwegians and they basically uh, had a pattern of um, establishing whaling stations in the north and then as the whale populations decreased so they went further south to try and uh, capture whales before the competition did and that's how they ended up in Ireland they were trying to capture whales on the migration route and uh, they knew how to have a good time as well I think this footage is just kind of funny um, these uh, maybe a bad weather day or maybe they're just doing it for the camera um, <laughs> dancing around the whaling station um, this is pretty sordid. I'll go back to that one again. The um, the potato sack race. It, it, it's only the short. There they are. Um, the next barrier they get to is actually a load of baleen blade racks. So they've been cut out of the, the whales' mouths and they're jumping over them. So um, they obviously weren't very sentimental about the whales. Um, but uh, yeah, and this is like a, a thumb war, but using your entire body and your leg. Um, <laughs> There we go. Very, uh, very imaginative games. And this is some sort of weird tug of war, which is obviously not very good for your back or neck. Um, absolutely incredible footage. And an, an important insight into the into the whaling, but also the, the lives of the whalers. Um, about half of whom were Irish. Most of the Irish were on based on shore. And those working on the vessels were mostly Norwegians. Um, the last station in, in 1923, the whaling station was burnt down in Black Sod under um, suspicious circumstances. Jealousy, they said, burnt it down. Um, and that was basically the end of shore-based whaling in, in Ireland. So um, I'll leave it there and I'll happily answer any questions. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much for that, uh, Connor. Wow, that, that footage at the end really was uh, extraordinary. And th that was from Black Sod? And um, no, that was actually from that was from the Inishkees one. So that was the, what was called the Aaron Moore Whaling Company it was based in um, on the Inishki Islands off of Black Sod. And um, the last remaining the last station to close was the one of Black Sod. They were quite close to each other. You know, the Inishkees and Black Sod are what five miles apart, something like that. And uh, the footage you saw there, I think, was from from the Aaron Moore Whaling Station because I think it was uh, 1908. The other one wasn't operational at that time. And is there, I mean, you showed us a picture there of some of the remains from the Donegal station. Are there any physical remains left on Inishki? Um, it's the only one I've not been to. It's harder to get to. Um, is it Anthony Irwin who lives up there? I think he said you can see, you can still see rusted remains. And um, there was even, there was even rumour that there were whale bones on the seabed there, which I kind of find hard to believe given the amount of sand that we moved around in the storms and all that. Um, I find it easier to believe that the, the sea locks in Scotland have whale bones because some of those stations were way off the back of sea locks, which are very, um, where there's not much wave action. I think there's some some bones there. The whaling station in, in the Isle of Harris and the Outer Hebrides is incredible. Like the chimney stack still standing, the buildings are still there, the pier is still there. But the, um, yeah, the remains of the Irish whaling station, there's very little left. I visited the site of Ellie Bay, which is the one of Black Sod, and I could just about make out um, uh, foundation, um, like tanks and buildings, foundations um, in the ground, but there was very little else uh, visible. 
Yeah. I mean, you mentioned there that, uh, you know, this was all very popular at the time that it was providing employment. I mean, I would have thought the west coast of Ireland would have had a reasonably healthy fishery, you know, for fish uh, at that time. I, I mean, I don't know. Was there is there any sense of was this particularly lucrative? Uh, were they making large amounts of money from the whales? And maybe, I mean, was it a case that most of that money was going to the Norwegians? Uh, they, they were creaming off the fat, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the money was mostly going to Norwegians, but um, the, the vast majority of the profits were, you know, these these people um, that were were running them were the, the oil barons of the day. You know, they were incredibly wealthy. Um, but locally, uh, you had big fallings out between villages where some people were getting lots of employment in, locally and then others were being excluded. Um, and then you had, uh, interesting, you had something that happened in three separate countries herring fishermen uh, campaigning against whaling um, it happened in Norway originally and then whaling was banned in Norway um, in the early 1900s that's why they came down here um, and then this, in Scotland in Shetland there was uh, campaigns by the herring fishermen and also in Ireland there was a lot of objections and partly they said it was because um, there was all different reasons given. Some were saying that the, the the herring would be scared by the by the ships, by the steamers, and by the sounds of the harpoons. Others had more kind of reasonable arguments against it, like there was so much um, offal and waste being spilled in in coastal waters that that would um, that would kill off the herring eggs, which that does seem pretty reasonable and likely. But um, I think there was a lot of jealousy around that the whalers were making so much more money uh, than the fishermen. But yeah, there were rich fisheries at the time, definitely. Yeah, and um, I mean, it's just as well there's no such thing as smell o vision. But I mean, you can imagine the stink of of those places with with the quantity of of rotten carcasses and offal and everything. It must have been pretty horrific. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, you you mentioned there there was there's intentional killing of whales. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Where is that happening and why? Um, it's happening in uh, the Faroes. It's happening in Iceland. Norway and Greenland and it's happening for it's happening in a different there's different kind of categories of whaling if you like there's um uh aboriginal and subsistence whaling which is you know a continued tradition uh whaling usually in places where there's very little other food sources um that uh, Greenland would be a case in point then there's just outright commercial whaling um and that kind of flouts the international agreement that was made in 1986 the moratorium on whaling and Iceland is a, is a case of that um, and, and Norway as well just down uh, coastal coastal minke whaling in Norway um, and then another example different kind of whaling again is in the Faroes which is referred to as a traditional hunt um, so they don't quite fall under the subsistence category or aboriginal because uh, it's it's kind of neither basically um, and interestingly, when I was working in the Faroes a few years ago, uh, I met a guy who um, admitted to making money from the pilot whales. So he gathered up the meat that wasn't being used and sold it onwards. So he was single-handedly undermining the the argument in favour of of, uh, of pilot whale uh, whaling, which was said to be non-commercial. So some people are profiting from it. So it's a total mess. Um, there's all different forms of whaling, and there's uh, you know I'm. I'm kind of at different comfort levels um, criticizing different ones because it'd be hard to criticize the um, the Greenlandic whaling, for example, if it's been um, low impact for for millennia. Um, um, but uh, I'd have a very strong opinion on the Icelandic whaling and uh, think it's was it uh, not uh, the case? Uh, uh, I might be wrong. I thought I saw a headline from a couple of years ago that Iceland was going to stop. Was that not the case? It's not well. I mean, this, that's we've been through it before with Iceland, like that. The change of government often, the government will say uh, we're not going to issue any more licenses, and that's the that's the situation where it now they said I think from twenty twenty four they're not going to issue issue any more licenses. But what the government hasn't done is they haven't um, um, prohibited uh, whaling. They need to legislate against it, um, and they've not done that. And until they do that, we're going to keep seeing the same thing. You know, a different government comes in and they start giving permits and then the next government revokes them. They just need to, it needs to be legislated against and, and that's not happened. So until that happens, I'm not really going to celebrate because, you know, it's, yeah, it, from year to year, it just keeps changing, which is a shame. 
Yeah, it's a great, and, and Norway, they, is it just uh, minke whales and fin whales they hunt in Norway? Just minke whales in Norway at the moment, um, yeah. That's, yeah, uh, I mean, I know from my own travels to Norway, I've never encountered any public un unrest about it or, you know, it doesn't seem to be controversial at all over there. No, no, I mean, the, the attitude among many is that it's just uh, another thing to be to be harvested, as they say, I hate that word harvest, um, <laughs> uh, like their like their fields of wheat. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just another thing to be to be exploited and um yeah, it's just just minky whales. I don't I don't mean that just minky whales, but it's only minky whales at the moment in, in Norwegian coastal waters, um, which are our minky whales as well. You know, they're the same whales that are uh, traveling through our waters. I think we should have more to say about it. But um, um, yeah, and then in the Faroes, it's not only pilot whales; it's also white-sided dolphins, wrist-hose dolphins um, as well. They're, they're being hunted there as well. And that's uh, like the pilot whales, is it? They're just killed for the. Yeah, you know, for no particular reason. Well, yeah, for human consumption. Um, They're eaten. It's, yeah, 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 eaten mm. and uh, and distributed among the community. But like I say, some people do profit from it. Um, uh, in Iceland, it's it's uh, for the profit essentially of one person, Christian Loftsen. He is the big um, the big producer up there. He also owns the biggest fish producing company in Iceland. So if you're um, if you're eating fish in Iceland, it's good to check that it's not from HP Grandy because uh, he uses the profits from that company to to fund his whaling operations. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's all quite complex and intertangled, isn't it? When you start to to break mm -hmm. it all apart, it's. Um, you mentioned uh, there has been some kind of a recovery since uh, the end. Well, the, I know the, the the whaling hasn't ended, but you know the predominant end of whaling. I mean, how is that? Is it a case that they is that recovery real? Are they are they now being hammered with other things? I mean, we, we were chatting before we started about krill fishing now in Antarctica. I mean, uh, you know, how optimistic can we be that whale populations are actually rebounding? Yeah, I mean, it's it is like species species by species, they all have different different um, problems, like. The amount of times I've been on ships where you know we very nearly hit fin whales, they are just incredibly prone to being hit by ships. They just don't seem to respond in the way you might expect. They act very erratically in front of a vessel, and, and they're very prone to ship strike. Um, so the more ships in the sea, the, the more fin whales are going to be killed. Um, minke whales are getting entangled in uh, crab and lobster and prawn pots up here in huge numbers, um, and humpbacks as well. In fact, the humpback whales in, in where I'm living in, in Scotland, and um, that one source of threat is enough to prevent them from recovering. So when you add all the other threats onto it, um, it it's yeah, it's a dire situation. Um, is there anything being done about that? The entanglement issue? Not really. I mean, we well, there are there's there's research being done on this. I'm trying to understand the problem better, and colleagues of mine are doing a really good job. But so that, that's you know trying to find out how are they being entangled in the first place, and then then the next stage would be to come up with suggestions on how to mitigate that. Um, but I mean, the government's kind of we have this MPA which has been in place for what seven years now, and it's essentially lines on a map with nothing, absolutely no policy. Um, and it's it's claims to protect minky whales, but <laughs> it doesn't do anything of the sort, and it's um, it's an embarrassment really. Um, and it's very very small. Um, you know, if we're going to go down the marine protected area route, I just think it's for big mobile species like this. If you're going to box off an area, you really have to know what it is that you're going to change in that area. Otherwise, it's a paper park. Um, I wonder if we had spent all the money that's been spent on the consultation and all that of MPAs in Scotland, if that had been spent instead on mitigating the entanglement and that one issue, that probably would, would benefit the whales much more than what, where we are now. Um, so it, I guess I don't want to poo-poo all marine protected areas, but the ones that I'm familiar with here at home um, are essentially pointless at the moment and I hope Ireland can learn from that and, and, and do a better job if it goes down the marine protected area route. Sometimes I feel like the money is better spent um, you know, limited budgets better spent trying to maximize the, the amount of prey that the, the whales have in an area and to mitigate the, the direct impacts from 
um, by catching entanglement and chip strike and things and things like that. Um, you know, all around in all of our waters instead of just um, putting all our eggs in one basket. Yeah, well, I hope you're I hope you're right. I hope we do end up with marine protected areas that are actually useful. Um, we just um, there's a couple of questions here I'd like to get to uh, before we log off. Uh, yeah. May is asking, I think it's a very interesting question. Is this research helping estimate pre-industrial whaling numbers? And would this contribute to defining a baseline for conservation efforts? That's a great question, May. I mean, that was my ultimate goal, but uh, unfortunately the data aren't up to that. Um, what I'm missing is the effort. So I all I have is the all I have is the minimum number of whales landed, and that's close to 900 in in, in Irish waters uh, for those eight or nine years. And um, what I don't have is how how many hours the whalers put in um, to capture those whales. So we don't know the densities. We can't work out what the densities of whales were, and we can't work out what the abundance of them was at that time. So um, all we're left with is an absolute minimum of what was out there. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a baseline in terms of abundance or density estimates, but we do have a baseline of uh, what the whale community was like. And uh, you saw in the earlier years, it was much uh, more rich. There were a lot more species around things like sea whales that we just don't see anymore. Yeah. Um, Paul is asking about the right whales. I mean, that photograph that you have, uh, I think that's in James Farley's uh, book. Yeah. And uh, I mean, to me, it's like watching the uh, the Tasmanian tiger, you know, that bit of footage that goes around. It's just like looking mm -hmm. at a ghost. You can't believe they have. We used to have these really not even that long ago. I mm -hmm. mean, is there any Paul is asking, you know, what can be done by the right whale? Uh, the, the numbers, I mean, is there any is there any hope for them, do you think? For right whales, I think our only hope is that um, the US and Canada can get their act together and, and prevent them from going extinct. And then then we would hope for spillover, that they might come visit our waters. I mean, there have been records. Um, I think Oliver O'Kaila saw a right whale in 2003 or something like that, way off um, Rockwell, that area. Um, and there have been wanderers, you know, one or two. Any of the ones that have been matched by photo ID uh, belong to the kind of the, the New England uh, whale population. So the occasionally ones wander over here from, from the Western North Atlantic. Um, but the only time we're gonna, the only situation where we get them to recover would be if there's spillover. So that population does so well that they basically become a, an exporter of, of right whales over here. Um, and that's, the, that's our only hope, I think, really, yeah. The the, uh, the the Canadians and the Americans do seem to be stricter than we are on this side of the Atlantic. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, definitely they they pump a lot more funding into it. There's a there's more coordination. Um, yeah, the the bottom line though is that the 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 way of capturing shellfish over there is not selective enough, and it's it's you know it's causing these animals incredible um, prolonged suffering, and you have whales that have been entangled multiple times in their lifetimes and mm. um have you looked into these uh pots that don't have ropes is that a, a real thing yeah they're being trialed in scotland at the moment um and they they work but they're expensive and um i think um you know buy-in from the fishermen they're a bit a little bit skeptical um in, at times some fishermen are all for it um, but it's just, you know, it's going to have to be a lot of money. There's going to have to be a lot of money put up for, for these. They're expensive. Um, but I understand the trials went well in Scotland. Um, the problem in here is that uh, it's the bottom lines that are entangling whales. So they're the ones that are between the pots. Um, whereas in um, New England, as far as I know, it's the riser lines. And the ropeless pots only prevent the riser lines from being in the water column, not the not the connecting lines on the bottom. So uh, a friend and colleague at the moment is trialing sinking lines, um, ones that uh, so the lines that join all the pots that they're not buoyant, that they're sinking, um, and then that should um, prevent all these loops of line up in the water column, and that should prevent uh, whales from being entangled in them. See, we don't we don't know like if the whales are seeking out rope to scratch in <laughs> you know that could be they could be actively looking for opportunities to wrap themselves and things and then just get caught um like they do with seaweed some species wrap themselves in seaweed and rub off seaweed um so we have more things to figure out but sinking rope i think is a is a great way to at least to, to start 
Unfortunately, I don't think we've had any instances of it in, in Ireland uh, entanglements, but maybe it's just a matter of time. Uh, you know? There are, yeah, I think yeah. it's just not been systematically analysed. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I um, did dissections on several link URLs that were entangled. Um, I just think the data maybe are not being collected in a way that allow for easy uh, overview. Um, Hopefully that will change. Um, but uh, and there's historical accounts of humpback whales. There was humpback whales killed in Brandon Bay in the 90s um, in in ropes, even when they were extremely rare back then. Um, so yeah, there's there's some cases, but I think it just doesn't it doesn't seem to be um, it's not as uh, intensively studied in Ireland at the moment. I hope that will change. Yeah. Uh, uh, Richard is just adding into the, the chat there that there are plenty of remains, he says, on Russian Island Station in Inish Key South. That would be, be interesting. I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, it is an interesting, as you say, archaeological, uh, industrial archaeological feature. It would be nice mm. to um, mark this, these sites in some way. I mean, I was on ACA last weekend. They, they do they have the, the, the pier where they caught all the uh, basking sharks is, is marked. You know, it's acknowledged. Celebrated oh, might be the wrong word, but it's acknowledged that it's part of their their cultural heritage, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, I think any chance to remind people of you know what was once here um, in these areas is 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 a really important opportunity we have to grasp. You know, and even a sign on the mainland on Ben Mullet somewhere where you could see um, where you could see the Inishkees, perhaps yeah, some uh, interpretive board or some some way to mark it um, would be. Would be great, yeah. But that's that's great to know, Paul. Uh, or sorry, Richard, about the the remains. And it's the only station I've not been to um, around here, so I'd love to get out and land. It's obviously very difficult to get to. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Richard has a comment there about uh, uh, how James Fairley met with the descendants of. Uh, I presume that's the the whaler uh, Lawrence Brun. Uh, mm. Maybe I'll keep that comment and send it on to you, Connor. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, maybe this is just as a last question then. I mean, is there uh, is there more information to be gleaned from this data, do you think? Or I mean, is that, uh, have you exhausted it? I think I've exhausted what I'm able to do in any way, but it, it'd be great to see other people pick it up and run with it. Um, um, my next plan is to try and get a handle on what happened in this 50s, 60s and 70s in Ireland. Um, but uh, yeah, with the with the minke whaling and the bottlenose whales uh, captures um, in the in the Celtic Sea, they were down off Waterford and Cork and everything. Um, and who was, who there, was so. doing that? So uh, they were Norwegian coastal. They were called coastal boats. But um, when they wiped out, not wiped out, but they they it was no longer profitable to hunt minke whales and bottlenose whales in Norwegian waters. So they kept going further and further afield. I just find it baffling that they, they filled these boats with uh, with ice and brought them down from Norway, put the whale meat on ice and sailed them all the way back to Norway. And it just seems incredible that it was worth their while to come down here for that. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's my next uh, in two weeks time. I'm going into the archives in Edinburgh to try and get more information on that and do something similar, hopefully. But uh, yeah, I think there could be more done with the seasonality of the whale captures and um, uh, Perhaps there's old diaries and notebooks out there. Perhaps the ship's log books are out there. I've not been able to find them, which would detail where exactly they were catching the whales because I've not been able to determine that for, for the Irish whaling. Um, but we have been able to determine that for the Scottish whaling. So there's more archive work to be done for anyone who's interested in it. We know the names of the ships. So um, it would be, um, yeah, might be able to figure out from the ship's log books where exactly they were spending time and therefore where, where the whales were. Yeah, very good, very good. Well, look, Connor, uh, that was really, really interesting, and thank you very much uh, for your time and and, uh, and that presentation. And thank you, uh, everybody at home, uh, for tuning in. And just a reminder, we will put it up on our YouTube channel later in the week, and, and do go on to that and uh, check out um, all our, uh, our our past uh, webinars. And just a reminder, please do. Um, Consider joining the IWT. We tr we have this webinar series. We run it for free. Uh, we like to keep all our activities accessible. So do consider uh, supporting us at IWT.ie in any way you can. Uh, and thank you and good night. We'll see you um, next month for our last webinar of this series for this year. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks again, Connor. Bye-bye. Take it easy.